Welcome to the second webinar in our Access for All guest speaker webinar series as we get closer to expanding CalFresh eligibility to SSI recipients starting on June 1st. My name is Brian Kaiser and I'm the Chief of the CalFresh and Nutrition Programs Bureau here at the California Department of Social Services as well as your host for today's webinar. This program expansion will significantly increase the number of Californians eligible for CalFresh. So this is a great opportunity to spend some time thinking about how we can truly make CalFresh food benefits accessible to all. The intent of this webinar series is to provide a platform for a range of guest speakers to address the topic of making CalFresh accessible for everyone. Throughout the series, we will discuss serving people with disabilities, serving seniors, serving diverse communities, and more. Today's webinar presentation is about serving people with disabilities. We are joined today by two incredible guest speakers from the Department of Rehabilitation and the State Council on Developmental Disabilities. I'll be introducing them in just a few minutes. We hope that you get at least one nugget of new information, new perspectives, or a new way of thinking about how you can most effectively do your work each day. We then hope that you'll incorporate these lessons learned into your practice as we head towards June 1st, 2019. First, let's go over some webinar logistics and give everyone a quick refresher on the policy change that brought us here together for this great series. Today's webinar will be in listen-only mode, which means you can connect your audio via your phone or your computer, but note that all lines will be muted during the presentation. We're happy to be offering live closed captioning for people with hearing challenges by clicking the link shown on your screen in the chat box and we will upload a closed caption version of each webinar to our webpage at cdss.ca.gov forward slash CalFresh SSI. Or if you just Google CalFresh SSI, it's probably the first thing you see. This brings me to our next logistical detail. How do you ask questions? You can ask questions by using the question pane feature on the right side of your screen. For today's presentation, we won't be answering questions live, but you can submit any questions at any time during the presentation, and your responses will be recorded, and we'll provide responses to all recipients after the webinar. Responses will also be posted to our website, along with the materials you see here and a recording of today's presentation. <laughs> Next, I'd like to do a quick plug for the upcoming webinars in our Access for All guest speaker series. On April 9th, we are doing a series on serving seniors that will be uh, hosted by the National Council on Aging. And then on April 16th, we have two webinars coming up. Uh, the first one is Serving People in Multiple Languages and Welcoming Immigrants. That's hosted by Just Communities. And then in the afternoon on the 16th, we'll be doing our final webinar in the series, which is Serving Diverse Communities and Advancing Racial Equity. That's going to be hosted by Public Health Advocates. If you haven't done so already, you can register for these webinars on our website that I mentioned before at CalFresh SSI. Before I turn it over to our guest speakers, let's provide everyone with a quick review of the upcoming policy change that will expand CalFresh eligibility to SSI recipients. California's cash out policy started in 1974 when the federal government began the combined federal and state SSI SSP program. At the time, states were allowed to increase the SSP portion of the grant instead of administering what was then known as the food stamp program. California opted for this cash out policy and increased the monthly SSP grant by $10. Back then, this change made sense as that amount was roughly equivalent to the average food benefit and it was an efficient way to provide food benefits to an eligible population. Under the cash out policy, SSI recipients have been ineligible for CalFresh food benefits because, in theory, they were already receiving the value of CalFresh benefits within their SSP grant. The challenge is that over time, the value of CalFresh benefits has increased with the rate of inflation, while the SSI cash in amount has remained flat at $10 and has lost relative value since 1974. This means that many SSI recipients who are living on a very limited budget intended to cover all basic needs are likely to have unmet food needs, but they're unable to apply for CalFresh food assistance. Last summer, Assembly Bill 1811 passed as part of the state budget, which reversed the policy known as cash out and put the wheels in motion to allow people receiving SSI SSP to apply for CalFresh on or after June 1st, 2019. If otherwise eligible, they will be able to receive food benefits on top of their standard SSI SSP grant. It's important to remember that there will be no change to the combined SSI SSP benefit as a result of this policy change. 
This merely provides an opportunity for these affected households to increase their total budgets. With that, I have the pleasure of introducing our two guest speakers. Tony Bamford is a training officer with the California Department of Rehabilitation's Disability Access Services, and Sheridan Nicolau is the regional manager from the State Council on Developmental Disabilities Bay Area Office. Welcome, Tony and Sheridan, and I'll hand it over to you now. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Brian. This is Sheridan Nicolau, as mentioned, with the California State Council on Developmental Disabilities. And on behalf of Tony Bamford from Department of Rehabilitation, we are thrilled to be here with you all today. So first things first, let's look at an overview of today's discussion here. What we'll do is we'll first start with helpful information about disabilities. Now to be clear, this is not meant to be a complete or an exhaustive list, but rather enough information and helpful hints for you all to prepare in your new roles. Then we'll be doing some work in creating access and combating ableism and explaining a little bit more about what that is. Then we'll be looking at tools, including people first language and plain language. Next, we'll be looking at communication tools and tips and then following it up with resources and supports. Next slide, please. So first, let's talk a little bit about the term disability and the definition. And it's important to note that in general, we're talking about a physical, a learning, a sensory-based, developmental, or psychiatric-based condition that may substantially impact major life activities. But that being said, it's important for us to understand that there is no universal definition of disability. And that definitions vary, in some cases very significantly, based on the socio-political and medical environment. Now, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. But well, one of the things that's important to understand is that anyone can become a member of this minority group at any point in their lives. And that's really exciting when you think about this. You're serving all minority groups and working with people from all walks of life within the disability minority group. So a note about definitions. So definitions are about classification or the organizing of people into categories. And that really is for the purpose of you know, eligibility, access, consideration, and if you think about it, definitions or eligibility requirements based on disability vary and think about some of the more common uh, groups or eligibility categories that we think of, whether that be special education, CalABLE, state intellectual and developmental disability services, social security, you get the idea. In general, in California, we see that based on percentages, we can expect that 6.8% to 20% of the population can be defined as having a disability, depending on the definition. So that's anywhere between 2.7 and 8 million Californians with disabilities. And now I'm going to pass it on to Tony. Next slide, please. Thank you very much, Sheridan. So I'm going to start off talking about physical disabilities, and most of us understand uh, what it is when we see a physical disability, an individual with a physical disability, but we're going to dive into it just a little bit more. Physical disabilities range in severity from limitations of stamina to paralysis. Some physical disabilities are caused by conditions presented at birth, while others are a result of illness or physical injuries. Physical abilities that we've talked that uh, are talked about uh, include, um, but aren't limited to, paraplegia amputation, arthritis, back disorders, cerebral palsy, neuromuscular disorders such as muscular dystrophy, multiple sclerosis, and fibromyalgia. Next slide, please. We also want to talk about learning disabilities. Uh, the term learning disability is a neurological disorder. In simple terms, a learning disability results from the difference in the way a person's brain is wired. Individuals with learning disabilities are as smart as or smarter than their peers, but they have difficulty in reading, writing, spelling, reasoning, recalling, and or organizational information. A learning disability can't be cured, but with the right support and intervention, individuals with learning disabilities can be successful. So there are some types of learning disabilities that I just want to highlight. Dyspraxia, um, affects a person's motor skills. This could affect uh, somebody if they eventually need to, if, uh, if they have problems with movement or coordination. It could be something as simple as holding a 
spoon or tying their shoelace that, that could start off as a problem, and later they may struggle with writing or typing. Dyslexia is a learned-based disability that affects reading that's related to your language-based skills. It affects your reading fluency, decoding, reading comprehension, recalling, spelling, and sometimes your speech. Dysgraphia is a learning disability that affects a person's handwriting and fine motor, motor skills. You may notice symptoms of illeg illegible handwriting or inconsistent spacing, or even just poor spelling as a symptom. Dyscalculia is a, dis a, a disability that affects a person's ability to understand numbers and learn math. And along with that, it could include poor comprehens comprehension of math skills, but over time, it could include difficulty telling time or having trouble with counting, just to name a few of them. Next slide, please. A sensory disability is one that affects one or more of your senses. We all know our senses as light, uh, a sight, hearing, touch, smell, taste, and there is an impairment with one of those. Some examples include wearing glasses if you have a slight sight impairment or if you're hard of hearing or you have a hearing aid, then you have a hearing impairment. Usually sensitivity of the palm of your hands or the soles of your feet are reported as touch sensitivities. And sensitivities with uh, noise and light can also be symptoms. Sensory processing disorders is a condition where a person receives, has trouble receiving and responding to information that comes through their senses. When someone has a sensory processing disorder, they are able to sense the information. However, the brain perceives and, an, and analyzes the information in an unusual way. Some people with sensory processing disorders are oversensitive to things in their environment. Common sounds may be painful or overwhelming and the feeling of certain textures on their skin may be uncomfortable. Next slide, please. Blindness is and low vision. Blindness is a lack of vision. It refers to the loss of vision that cannot be corrected with glasses or lenses. Partial blindness means you have very limited vision. Complete, complete blindness means that you cannot see anything and you do not see light. Most people who use the term blindness mean complete blindness. And people with vision that is worse than 2200 with glasses or contact lenses are considered legally blind in most states in the US. We will discuss mo the most common visual uh, conditions on the next few slides. Next slide, please. So vision also refers to a partial or loss of vision. This vision can happen suddenly or over a period of time. Low vision is uncorrectable vision, loss that interferes with daily activities, and it's better defined in terms of function rather than a numerical testing. In other words, low vision is not enough vision to see whatever it is that you need, which can vary from person to person. Some types of vision loss never lead to complete blindness. So let's look at a couple that are the more common ones that people hear about. Next slide, please. So for those uh, that are looking at the screen, if you're an individual who can't see the picture, let me describe what you're seeing. This slide includes a close-up of a picture of a baby. The left side of, is a view through the healthy lens and the photo is very clear. The right side shows an image of the baby through a cataract lens, lens and it is cloudy and blurry. Cataracts is a condition in which the lens of the eye, is, which is normally clear, becomes cloudy or, and opaque. Cataracts usually form slowly and without pain. They can affect one or both eyes. And over time, a cataract may interfere with vision, causing images to appear blurry or fuzzed and colors seem to fade. Let's look at another one. Next slide, please. A view of color blindness. The picture on this side is of two donuts. The first donut on the left side has bright yellow, green, blue, pink, red candies all over it. The second donut is more muted colors of blue, pink, and red candies with some colors missing due to color blindness. 
color blindness itself is a vision problem with a for a <clears throat> in which a person distinguish has difficulty distinguishing certain colors most commonly red and green but sometimes blues and greens or blues and yellows also have problems color blindness is not really a form of blindness it's more of a deficiency in color perception just an fyi it is more common in males than it is in females. There is no treatment or cure for persons with uh, color blindness, but you can learn to adapt in various ways. For example, a color blind driver can remember that the lighting position on the top of a traffic light is the red one and so forth. Next slide, please. This is a picture of a young boy and a girl playing in a ball pit. The left side is clear and the right side contains disorder due to muscular degeneration. This condition affects the center portion of the eye and affects your details. Mas macular degeneration causes blurred distortion and dim vision or blind spots in the center of your visual field. Peripheral vision is not generally affected. This condition is painless and may progress so gradually that, it, that the affected person may not uh, notice the changes in the beginning. Next slide, please. And finally, a view of diabetic retinopathy. This is a picture of a sky with a mountain view and a meadow. meadow. The left side is clear and the right side is a blurred image with dark patches throughout the photo. Eye conditions that result from the image, image effect, image, from the damaging effects of diabetes in a circular stem of the retina. The longer a person has diabetes, the greater likely the person will develop diabetic retinopathy. Next slide, please. <clears throat> now let's talk about deaf and hard of hearing. Deafness can keep you from hearing all sounds. Hearing loss is being partially or totally unable to hear the sound in one or both of your ears, and hearing disorders make it hard but not impossible to hear. Patients may not always want to disclose that they have hearing loss. This may due to denial, stigma, or fear of being treated differently. And rather than focusing on the hearing loss, Next slide, please. So some common indications that you might run into if you're dealing with a patient with hearing, hearing loss or deafness might be often, they often ask statements to, or questions to be repeated. They often misunderstand conversations and information, especially in noisy and busy environments. There's a difficulty understanding when they cannot see the speaker's face. And one tends to turn their one ear towards a person speaking and cupping their hand behind their ear. A lot of times you will find that the person who is hard of hearing often speaks louder to compensate for their needs, or they may complain that people are mum mum mumbling. Excuse me, next slide, please. Some effective uh, examples of communication when you're talking with somebody who is deaf or hard of hearing might be to reduce the background, background noise, minimize visual distractions, be sure the room is low width, well lit and the light source should be in the front of the person speaking not behind them be sure your patient can see your mouth oh don't chew gum or put a pin in your mouth or cover your mouth with your hand and of course some great ways that are simple to be able to communicate with somebody who is deaf or hard of hearing range from a dry erase board to amplified telephones to using your phone or your computer and of course having a interpreter so with that, let's pass it on to Sheridan. Great, thank you, Tony. Next slide, please. Great, so what we're gonna do now is we're gonna talk a little bit about developmental disability. And really what that is, is that is a grouping or a classification of different categories of disabilities that are considered developmental in nature. And for the purpose of today, we're going to be using uh, the Developmental Disabilities Assistance and Bill of Rights Act 
uh, which has been around for about 40 years and was most recently amended in the year 2000. And that is the act that also uh, has the state Council on Developmental Disabilities uh, written into law there on a national or federal level. So a developmental disability, according to the Bill of Rights Act, is an attributable to a mental or a physical impairment or a combination of mental and physical impairments and manifests before the individual turns 22 and is likely to continue indefinitely. Next slide, please. And it's important in addition to what you saw on the slide uh, before is that it, we know that developmental disability results in substantial functional limitations in three or more of the following areas of major life activity, okay? So any three or more of the following. That could be self-care, receptive and expressive language, learning, mobility, self-direction, capacity for independent living, and economic self-sufficiency. And an important caveat here is this also includes infant and young children from birth to the age of nine who have substantial delay or specific congenital or acquired condition, one that may be considered to turn into or develop into a developmental disability without having to meet the three or more limitations in areas of major life activity. So for there, you're looking at, is there a high probability for this infant or young child to result in having a developmental disability later in life if services aren't provided during that time? So that's included as well. Next slide, please. So now we're looking at the California definition of a developmental disability, and this is very specific. This is for the purpose of qualifying for intellectual and developmental disability services through the Department of Developmental Services and the Regional Center System. So note that in California, just like many states, uh, they have different definitions with different eligibility standards for what qualifies as a developmental disability for the purpose of those services. We talked a little bit about that before. So in this case, through the Lanterman Act, the definition includes intellectual and developmental disabilities or intellectual di uh, disability, cerebral palsy, uncontrolled epilepsy, autism spectrum disorder, and the fifth category. So a little note about the fifth category. So what that is, is that's a term that includes disabling conditions found to be closely related to intellectual disability or to require treatment similar to that required for individuals with an intellectual disability, but doesn't include other conditions that are solely physical in nature. So that's what's called the fifth category. So it catches those conditions that are very similar. And for California through the Lanterman Act, the definition for eligibility is two parts. So it includes these five categories of developmental disabilities, and it's also looking for significant functional limitation in three or more areas of major life activity. And now I'm gonna pass it back to Tony. Next slide, please. Thank you very much, Sheridan. I did also wanna mention that there is a handout, if you did not see it on, uh, on your toolbar that you can, uh, print out that will give you more information also. So let's move on to mental health, psych psychiatric based disabilities. Mental health includes our emotional, psychological, or social well-being. A mental illness is a condition that affects a person's thinking, feeling, or mood. It, help, it also helps determine how we handle stress, how we relate to others, and how we make choices. Mental health is important in every stage of your life from childhood to adolescence through adulthood. Some examples, just so you know, of mental health um, or psychiatric based disabilities include attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, panic disorder, post traumatic stress disorder, bipolar disorder, depression, obsessive compulsive disorder, eating disorders, schizophrenia, to name a few. Next slide, please. So over the course of your life, you may have experienced mental health problems and that affect your mood, your thinking, your behavior, and many factors contributing to mental health uh, problems include biological factors, such as your genes or the brain chemistry, your life experiences, such as trauma or abuse, your family history of mental health uh, problems, or individuals that, and individuals that have experienced, have, may have different experiences even if they have the same diagnosis. 
Next slide, please. And back to you, Sheridan. Thanks, Tony. So what you all are seeing now, now we're gonna move away from definitions and explaining conditions, and we're gonna move into more of the systemic understanding of how important it is that we recognize ableism and that we find ways to integrate tools and supports into our daily work to better support people of all abilities and for those with disabilities. So the picture that you have before you here is a nice little visual from a French website. And it's a picture that's broken into four quadrants. So first I'll start with the top right. And that's, that is a representation of exclusion. So if you think about that, that's what many countries are still experiencing in terms of practice, policy, law, everyday experience for people with disabilities. And certainly it's a huge part of our history here in the United States. And what it shows is it shows a picture um, of a circle with many individuals' icons representing people inside the circle. Outside of the circle, you have icons and pictures that are depicting people with disabilities. So exclusion is just what it says, meaning that many times individuals and their families were isolated, uh, were not acknowledged, and certainly didn't have supports in place to become productive members of the community. In many cases, people were hidden away or are hidden away, depending on what geographical location we're talking about. And certainly, there was not support policy and infrastructure in place for those individuals. So in the top right quadrant of this picture, we see a representation of segregation. What we see is that same large circle with little icons, little pictures of people inside. And then next to it, you see a smaller circle and that smaller circle is separate from the larger circle and has pictures or icons of people with disabilities. So this represents, particularly for the United States, the time where we saw a rise in state hospitals and in developmental centers. So that's where, as a society, we acknowledge that people with disabilities exist in our community. However, that's when you saw segregated, isolated environments that really didn't intersect with the rest of the community. Hence, you see the smaller circle that is not interacting or touching the larger circle representing the larger community. In the bottom left quadrant, you see a picture representing integration. And for a good part, this is really where we are now in the United States, and we're moving towards inclusion. But in many cases, we're still in the quadrant representing integration. And what that is, is that's that same large circle with people representing a majority of community members in the circle. And within that circle is a smaller circle with icons or pictures representing people with disabilities. So what it's showing is it's showing that people with disabilities are within the larger community and yet are still segregated. And so if you think about traditional special education services, if you think of sheltered workshops, if you think of segregated housing, this gives you some examples of what integration looks like. And as a society, what we're moving towards is we're moving towards a paradigm shift of a process of inclusion. And that's represented in the bottom right quadrant. What that is, is that it's that same one circle. There are no other circles. And within the large circle, you see everybody represented. You see pictures or icons that are representing all individuals together. And what that represents is that we have a society where we have policy, legislation, practices, and most importantly, tools and infrastructure that support all people in the community to be a part of their community in the larger sense. That's truly what inclusion is. And so this is important. The reason why we're sharing this is it shows the direction of where we have been as a society and where many societies still are across the globe and where we're going. And it shows the move towards inclusion and how laws, policies, practices, and social norms impact how people with disabilities are included or not, and including how people with disabilities are seen or not seen. Next slide, please. So now we're going to talk a little bit. That really set the stage for us to discuss ableism. And in short, when we think of ableism, we can think it's one of the isms. That's how I like to explain it when I'm talking about it in the community. So think about racism, sexism, classism, 
and discrimination against LGBTQI populations. And that gives you a sense of what we mean by ableism. And we have to first start with the premise of understanding that disability rights are really civil rights. And that ableism, what it can do is it takes the form of ideas, of assumptions, stereotypes, attitudes, practices, physical barriers in the environment, or large-scale oppression. And when people display or support ableism, it's important to understand that sometimes this is unintentional. And in fact, most people are completely unaware of the impact that their words or their actions have. And they're unaware that they are participating in ableist systems. And this is why Tony and I are so thrilled to join you all today, because you are in important roles in identifying and changing these ableist systems that we're all a part of and moving towards that paradigm shift of true inclusion. So this is very exciting for us to be able to do together. Next slide, please. So what can we do to combat ableism? So we just talked about what it is. We talked about disability rights as civil rights and that it's one of the isms that we need to recognize and actively work against. So the top three bullet points here are, are very easy. This is typically what you would see when you're looking at any type of ism that we're looking to uh, combat. But it's important to know that although education, outreach, and inclusion, those are all very important, we can't just think of this in terms of awareness, but it has to be active work to dismantle ableism and to actively work to make life better for people and make life more equitable for all people, including people with disabilities. And so that includes things like community leadership and role modeling, which is part of why we're joining you all today to help you do that. It also includes things like systems change, policy change, law change, upholding existing laws. And obviously, this is, this is part of what we're here meeting about today. It's very exciting for all of us and all of you to be involved with the systems change. And it's important that we teach others to see ableism and how to combat it. And then it's one thing to talk philosophy and theory, but it's important that we use tools every day. Uh, to actively combat ableism, and that includes tools like plain language and people-first language. And all of these things really speak to the role in modeling inclusion, accessibility, and good allyship. It's really all of our responsibility in that sense. Next slide, please. So just to start off that conversation, we're going to start with a real basic assumption that words do have an effect. They have an effect on others, but more importantly, words can have an effect on policy, practice, law, how laws are treated. So we want to choose words with dignity. People with disabilities are entitled to full civil rights and of course want to be accepted as equals. People don't want special treatment. They want equitable treatment. And so what we write or what we say can really enhance dignity and promote positive attitudes about others' abilities or others' differences. And we want to emphasize worth and abilities, not necessarily highlighting the disabling condition, and part of that is a baseline understanding of using person-first language rather than, I, rather than disability-first language. And then I want to introduce another phrase, and we're going to talk about all of these. So another phrase would be using identity-first language only when a person indicates that you should, and when referring to them, we'll talk about what that means, person-first language versus identity-first language. And, but first, just understanding that language does have an impact on these things. And we want to invest in our word choices, both the words that we use verbally, the words that we use on paper, on our website, in posting, in forms. All of those things have significance and consequence and value. Next slide, please. So this talks a little bit about people first, language. So in general, remember, a disability descriptor is really just a medical diagnosis or a sociopolitical definition. People-first language respectfully puts the person before the disability so that it acknowledges that a person with a disability is more like people without disabilities and more like able-bodied people than really different. So here are some common ways to make sure that we're using people-first language as a default way to talk about and with people with disabilities. So to start off, and I'll talk through some of these bullet points, one would be using people with disabilities. Another would be using phrases like, if I'm talking about, in this case, my neighbor, my neighbor has a disability, not a phrase like my neighbor suffers from and then whatever their condition is, or my neighbor is a and labeling them as such. 
using people who are nonverbal or people who communicate using icons, AAC devices, ASL, eye movements, written means. And just for those of you unfamiliar, AAC refers to augmentative and alternative communication, and ASL refers to American Sign Language. So all of those phrases that are in bold there would be preferred to uh, the other more labeling or disability first types of language that you see on the slide. Another example would be use people with mental health conditions or people with psychiatric disabilities. We want to really think about how we use terms or um, uh, things like mental or crazy, the way we use those words, and think about them. They, they, are, uh, they are slanderous and they, and they are disrespectful to people with psychiatric disabilities or mental health conditions. So we can think about how we use or don't use those words and try to monitor and, and um, change our language accordingly. And the last example on the slide is use, this person receives special education services. Rather, what sometimes we hear quite often, which is referring to a special ed kid or a special ed kiddo, or that person is special ed, which when you think about it, doesn't even make any sense. So those are just some examples. And if you want to learn more, there are many wonderful websites and great tools, including on the Department of Rehab and the State Council on Developmental Disabilities website. But I also want to draw your attention to a website called disabilityisnatural.com. They have some wonderful articles that talk about people first language and the importance of it, and they give a variety of different charts. And that's just one resource of many that I wanted to point out. Next slide, please. So now let's talk a little bit. I had mentioned a couple slides ago about identity first language. So how do we know when to use people first language and when to use identity first language? So first I want to talk a little bit, I, I want to give a, um, a definition or a discussion point about identity first language. And what I'm going to read to you is from the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network, ASAN. And they say that many self-advocates prefer terminology, terminology that is identity first because of the understanding that their condition is an inherent part of their identity, much in the same way that someone might identify as a Muslim American or let's say a gay man. So when we think about that, that would be for the person with the disability to decide if that is if they would like to use identity first language or have others choose identity first language about them. So in general, this is your cheat sheet here, <laughs> your default way is to refer to people using people first language. That is a great default. Now, if and when someone gives you clues that they would like for you to use identity first language when speaking with them or about them, do that, but only use identity first language for the person that indicates the preference and only about them. And again, your default should always be people first language. And just to give a little example, there are three communities where you see this more often and you may have already had experiences in this way. And this would be for communities within the blind and low vision community, with communities within the deaf and hard of hearing community, and with communities within the autistic community. So for those three communities of people with disabilities, there's a there are certain community groups that will prefer and will let you know that identity first language is how they want to be referred to. And they, chances are they're not gonna come out to you and say explicitly that we'd like you to use identity first language, which is why it's so important to listen respectfully and to really hear and seek to understand an individual and how they want to be referred. Next, link, next slide, please. Now, this is another tool that can be very helpful in all of our work, and it's something that's pretty easy to start using right now, and that's called plain language. So plain language is writing that is designed to be easy to read and to comprehend. And it ensures that readers can understand as quickly, completely, and easily as possible. It's meant to be clear, straightforward, and very accessible in nature. And the point is, is that it should be inclusive of readers with disabilities, including and also readers where English is a second language, members of the aging population, people experiencing trauma, et cetera. So it's good for a wide variety of individuals. And plain language avoids obscurity, inflated vocabulary, jargon, or convoluted or complex sentence structure. And the State Council on Developmental Disabilities has some great resources, among other resources for plain language. 
I want to give just a couple other examples. We have a couple of pages that are pretty easy here for anyone who's interested, but one would be to write short, shorter sentences and to keep the subject, the verb, and the object close in the sentence and to place words carefully and avoid double negatives if you can. Another example would be to organize content so that the information and the procedures are presented in an order in which the material will make sense to the reader, thinking about the broadest category as possible of readers. And then generally when starting to write in a plain language format, you want to identify and understand your readers and their needs. Who are they? What is their likely reading level? What do they already know about the subject at hand? And what do you want them to know? And then what do you need to do and how do you need to write to convey this information? And again, this is not just about writing in a way where you're more likely to be understood completely uh, by people with disabilities, but the much broader community so that all people have the best possibility of understanding completely and easily as possible. So think about how plain language may influence the way that let's say your flyers look, the way that your forms and website might look, the way you exchange printed or posted notices. This is really good to start to think about. And next slide, please. And I'd like to pass this back on to Tony. Thanks again. One thing that we did want to mention really quickly, even though it really doesn't fit into specifically what we're talking about here, is we want to talk about physical access. Physical access is important for everybody and extra attention should be taken to ensure there's inclusion for individuals with disabilities. Physical barriers are structural ob obstacles in nature or man-made environments that prevent or block movement and moving around in the environment or the access. And we all know, of course, that we all take advantage of these wonderful accessible uh, items that are in our society today, the automatic door openers and such. Um, so when you're out there, just kind of keep your eyes open on, on what looks like it may be a barrier with regards to a building or a ramp, maybe a door or an elevator. If you're going into the restroom and there's six there, you really need to use the big stall if it's not something you actually need. What if you use one of the regular size stalls? Okay, Sheridan, back to you. Thanks, Tony. Next slide, please. So the next several slides here, everybody, we're going to look at some communication techniques and tools. These are meant to give you some, some tools or strategies to use right away with people of all, of all kinds, particularly people with disabilities. So we're gonna start off by talking about general communication techniques. And we started to discuss some of these in earlier slides. So that would be to maintain peer appropriate interactions and communication, to use plain language, for example, age appropriate language, non-technical terminology. We want to watch for any difficulty that someone may have in processing multiple or complex commands, questions, or instructions. We want to keep things simple and calm. We want to check for comprehension and we want to wait for responses and then repeat or rephrase our requests or our questions as necessary. A good rule of thumb would be to provide a instruction or a question that's one step and then wait two seconds for a response before considering if the answer was heard and or if you need to repeat or rephrase. Next slide, please. Some other tips to improve communication. And some of these, again, we discussed earlier. And it includes making sure that people can see your face. So removing dark sunglasses, your hat, figuring out where the light source is so that you can make eye contact with an individual, adjusting yourself physically to the level of the individual, right? So if I'm having more than, a, let's say, a minute-long conversation with someone who's using a wheelchair, I would want to be able to either relocate our conversation or find a chair so that I can sit down and be eye level with the individual. You want to make sure not to run your words together when speaking. You want to make sure that the person can repeat back to you in whatever form or fashion they can communicate what they've heard if you're concerned that your message wasn't received. You want to use visual communication. That could be gestures, facial expressions, pictures, written notes, diagrams, demonstrations. And then going back to plain language, using common words and short sentences. 
And of course, we want to make sure that you're addressing the person directly. So some people may be meeting with you and they may have an assistant or an interpreter or perhaps a family member. It's important that we're addressing them directly, not their assistants, family members, or interpreters. Next slide, please. So additional tips to improve communication, including, this is really basic, but important to point out, ask people how they prefer to communicate. You don't have to know everything and you don't have to guess when somebody walks in your office at how they best communicate. Just simply ask them. Pay attention to any pointing or gestures or nods, any sounds or eye gaze, eye blinks. Try using pen and paper. Maybe asking a person to spell a word if you feel like you weren't able to understand the word that they were sharing with you. And don't guess if you can avoid. That can be very frustrating to people with communication challenges. And ask a person if they use a device, a communication board or an app. You'd be surprised that a lot of people use these, but are sometimes unsure when they're meeting someone for the first time if the person that they're meeting with would be comfortable using that same device or tool. And for those individuals who are maybe uh, less verbal in nature or people that are, uh, don't use verbal communication, you may want to ask them things like, show me how you say yes, show me how you say no, and show me how you point. Uh, and I give some examples on this slide. That could be, for example, some people may uh, show you or let you know that yes is one blink and no is two blinks, and three, three blinks might please repeat that or help. And only if needed, ask questions of the support staff, the assistant, or the interpreter about the best way to communicate with a person. But in general, that person is going to be the best resource for you to know how to communicate successfully with them. Next slide, please. Additional tips to improve communication would be when showing somebody to a chair, let's say somebody with low vision or uh, who has blindness, you might, you might want to place their hand on the back of a chair with their permission. If, you, if someone is using a service animal, do not speak to or pet the animal. Even referring to the animal or making comment about the animal sometimes can distract the service animal. People with visual impairments may prefer elevators to escalators, so just keep that in mind if you're walking um, to another area of the building together. And of course, you want to speak directly when facing a person because your voice will orient the person if they are low vision or someone who is blind. And give specific directions describing obstacles in the path of someone that might have a visual impairment or who is low vision. So for example, saying things like the desk is at six o'clock or the door is four steps in front of you is very helpful if someone is in your office for the first time and really doesn't know the layout of the land. And when providing help to sign a document, ask if they want you to show them the location of the signature line. And always ask. Don't assume that somebody needs help, but first ask if they would like help. Next slide, please. These are some additional tips. For example, don't initiate touch before asking. So you would want to ask or you would want to offer a handshake first. This is particularly important when working with people who may have sensory conditions or sensory sensitivities. Let's say you're working with a person that has no arms or no hands and shaking hands is appropriate. Maybe instead you're lightly touching their shoulder with their permission. Follow their lead. Ask permission before touching or moving somebody's cane, their walker, or their wheelchair. Remember that tool is an extension of them. And when speaking to a person using a wheelchair or a scooter for more than a few minutes, and we mentioned this before, try to find a way so that you can be eye level with that individual. Reduce and address external stimulus. So for some individuals, you may note that you may have a more successful interview or meeting if you can reduce some of those external stimuli in the area. And feel free to ask, is something uncomfortable? If you suspect that someone has a sensory discomfort or a distraction, it, it never hurts to ask people what you can do to make the experience more comfortable for them. Next slide, please. And then the next couple of slides I wanted to share with you are some quotes directly from self-advocates, from people with disabilities. Uh, and they shared this with the understanding of, for people that, have, uh, that are relatively new to working with a diverse group of people, what are some tips that are important to keep in mind? So I'll read some of these with you. I'm a person first and also happen to have a disability. 
If you need information about the disability, don't hesitate to ask me directly. Ask me how you should refer to my disability. Ask if assistance is needed rather than assuming it is. Follow my instructions. And don't assume that a person with one disability also has others. Everyone is different. Maintain eye contact and talk to me, even if I'm using an interpreter support staff. Next slide, please. If I have a speech impairment or use an AAC device, be patient. Give me time to respond. Don't finish my sentence and ask me to repeat if necessary. And then I'll just read one more from here. Don't hesitate to use everyday expressions. It's okay to say things like, see you later, to a person who is low vision or who is blind, or to say, hey, let's go take a walk to a person who's in a wheelchair. Don't get hung up on those everyday expressions. Those are very fine and comfortable for most people. And now I'm gonna pass this on to, to Tony, and next slide, please. Thank you, Sheridan. What great tips you offer. Um, now I want to look at communication in the form of digital documents because a lot of times we are communicating with people digitally and we need to know what our requirements are and what we need to do. So digital documents that are provided for the public or any official agency communication should be accessible for individuals with disabilities. And digital documents should be created following federal and state disability guidelines, laws and best practices. For example, there's parts of the Americans with Disabilities Act that everything comes out of state or local governments will be accessible. We also have information of the United States Rehabilitation Act, Section 508 that you need to be, uh, be aware of, and California government codes. There's several of them, 11135, 7405. We can talk about those later. But there are guidelines and laws and got, uh, best practices out there to assist individuals so that they're all receiving the same communication. The state administrative manual, there is so much. So please feel free to put a note in the questions area if you wanna know more about those laws and we'll be sure to pass the information on. Okay, Sheridan, back to you. Thanks, Tony. Next slide, please. So as we wrap it up here, we want to share a few things with you. And first would be other elements of support and technical assistance. So both the State Department of Rehabilitation and the State Council on Developmental Disabilities, part of our roles is to provide technical assistance and to support others, whether that's individuals, families, organizations, other state departments, in better supporting and working with people of all abilities, and particularly those with disabilities. So feel free to reach out. You can contact your regional office of the California State Council on Developmental Disabilities, and we have that website in the slide there. And you can contact your local office of the State Department of Rehabilitation. We also have that website there. And of note, Department of Rehabilitation has a Disability Access Services line, and I want to read that number briefly to you. That would be 916-558-5725. Additionally, as another resource, would be to find where your local independent living center is. And the best way to do that would be through the CFILC website. That's the California Foundation for Independent Living Centers. And we have the website listed there. And that's a great way to find about which ILC's independent living centers are closest to you and can help you with additional support and technical assistance in addition to your colleagues at the State Council on Developmental Disability and the Department of Rehabilitation. And back to you, Tony. Okay, thank you. So just a couple of tools I also wanna share with you. Um, did you know that your Microsoft Office and Adobe have built-in accessibility checker checkers? You can have a, the program check it for you and do a first wave to see if everything is accessible for individuals with disabilities. That's not the only way you should do it, but it's a really great fresh, uh, really great start. The other thing is Department of Rehabilitation also has classes that we provide. Um, two of, oh, next slide, please. Um, two of them are the ones on the slide there, accessible Microsoft document, Office documents and accessible PDF documents 2.0. To find out more about those classes, please go to DOR's website. Back to you, Sheridan. Next slide, please. 
Great. And on behalf of Tony and I, thank you so much. At this point, we're going to pass this back to our partners at CDSS and the CalFresh team to talk about other resources that you see above here. Thank you so much, Tony and Sheridan. That was really, really outstanding. Um, I really appreciate your perspective. Um, it's always exciting to learn something new, and I, I can speak personally that I definitely learned um, some new tips and tricks for uh, dealing with the population that I don't encounter on an everyday basis here at CDSS, and I hope that each of our listeners also found some useful information to help shape their interactions with people with disabilities. Um, as we move into uh, June 1st, um, it's rapidly approaching. There's uh, several hundred thousand uh, new people that will be interacting with uh, through our program, and this was really terrific, so thank you both. Um, I wanted to highlight a few more resources that are available on our CalFresh SSI webpage. Um, you see on screen here um, several links. We'll be sharing this presentation um, with all of these links as well, so you'll be able to download this from our website and then go right to the uh, use the links that are in, embedded on the presentation. So this will all be available to you shortly, as well as the closed captioning. Um, and next slide, please. And here are a few final reminders. Um, Serving Seniors is our next presentation by the uh, NCOA National Council on Aging. That's on Tuesday the 9th from 1030 to 1130. Uh, if you'd like to register for that one or any of the others, please visit cdss.ca.gov forward slash CalFresh SSI. And you can always email us at CalFreshSSI or at dss.ca.gov if you have any questions um, in the interim. Uh, we have staff here that uh, monitor that inbox every day and are uh, able to uh, direct traffic and get that to the right person for an answer. Um, so that's the conclusion of our web, uh, webcast today. Again, all of this information will be available online. Um, Tony and Sheridan, thank you again so much for your contributions. That was a, a really terrific presentation, and we'll see you all soon. Thank you.